All right, everyone, we are going to get started here. Before we begin, though, I have a little gift for those of you up front. Those of you who decided to uh, sit in the back, I do apologize if you would like to bum rush each other up here to get a free gift. Anyway, we have these homemade cards that me and my partner here made. I hand drew every single one of them, and then he got them laminated and foil stamped. They're holographic cards, each one containing a uh, character related to the Second Genesis era. I'm going to pass them out to those of you up front. Hopefully you get a character you at least uh, like or at least recognize. <laughs> Thank you for coming out. Thank you for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. Hey, Dapper Man. There you go. There you go. Thank you, David. You don't get one. You're the camera girl. with home conversions here and there. 
that's what the master system was, is trying to bring their arcade experience to your television set. <laughs> so, um, unfortunately though, it was not that successful because of one uh, significant system known as the Nintendo Entertainment System. Um, as we know, Nintendo had that huge market share in regards to pretty much resurrecting the gaming industry in the 80s because of the Atari crash. Um, furthermore, Nintendo had very fierce policies about what could be developed for um, and what couldn't be developed for. Um, if you developed a game for the NES, you were not allowed to develop said same game for other systems. They could potentially sue you over that. That was a thing. Um, Nintendo is a much better company uh, internally now than it was back in the day. Um, but at the time, they, like, they ruled the gaming industry with an iron fist at the time. It wasn't that the Master System didn't have any games. It had some good games like Shinobi and you know Outrun and Hang On. But in terms of third-party support, it had next to none because of Nintendo's policies. Um, now, because of this, Nintendo, I mean Sega, of course, they had to move forward. They did not stop supporting the Sega Master System, but they still had to make something else to kind of put, make that big push forward. And that came in the form of the Sega Genesis. <laughs> Was what if you had 
seven sounds that you need to use, or eight, or twelve, or sixteen. But you only have six spots to put them. What they did was they did track switching, which was really cool how they did it. Like say, you play a part in the synth line one, and that plays out, you don't need it anymore. Let's bring in another sound and use it to give it more of a uh, wider sound. That one's still going and we're done with synth too. Let's bring in another sound there, maybe another bass line or a guitar or something. And so on and so forth. And it would just switch them around. Like when I was splitting apart um, soundtracks for Sega Genesis because I wanted to remaster them, kind of make them sound bigger than they were, um, I noticed a lot of times the drums would go through different, different channels. So I'd have drums start here, then they'd be up on channel one, then they'd come down to five, and so on. The bass line would do the same thing, but chasing the bass line was fun. <laughs> but all in all, with all the, the trickery and voodoo that they did, we got stuff like this. One of my favorite songs right here. Nostalgia for me, like back in the day, this this is my love of the Genesis right here, that, the music. Back in the day, I would hook my little cassette recorder up to the Genesis or my TV or whatever, and I would sit there and go into the BGM or try to find the code to unlock the sound test or something, and sit there and just record songs from all the Genesis games I have, put them on cassette tape, pop that tape in my Walkman, jam out on my bus ride to, to school, and just, I ate that up. It's a true pioneer people. <laughs> and to be honest with you, I mean, I had like five of my, that I did the most. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Tournament Fighters was a huge one for me. I think I probably wore the sound test out in that game. <laughs> if not the tapes. Uh, Streets of Rage 1 and 2, phenomenal soundtracks for me. I probably played two the most. Um, at the time, it was Sonic 2. I love Sonic 2 soundtrack, but... Then we got Sonic 3. Sonic 3 was Woo! absolutely amazing. And then a little known game, uh, Musha, which was a shoot 'em up for the Genesis. Fantastic game, amazing soundtrack. What, what were some that you liked? Oh man, some of my favorite soundtracks for the Genesis have to be like uh, Shinobi 3, which I love that game overall. That was a good fantastic one. soundtrack. I have it on vinyl. Um, Pulse Man had an amazing like electronica soundtrack for yeah. its time. Uh, I also liked the very, um, the very atmospheric soundtrack for Shea Khan, the Forever Man, was very dark and foreboding. And then of course there was the, the lighter side silliness of Earthworm Jim 2. Earthworm Jim was just so much fun. If you, ever, if you ever played Earthworm Jim 2 and you've, uh, if you've watched the intro, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the hardware capability. So of course the Genesis here in the States was released August 14, 1989. There were a total of seven launch titles, which is pretty impressive for its time. Um, even by today's standards, actually. Uh, you had games like, uh, you know, Thunder Force 2, uh, you know, Oozlin Ghost, which is from Capcom, Alice Kidd in the Enchanted Castle, Space Harrier 2, hey. Tommy Lazorda his baseball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Woo! <laughs> um, Final Encounter, and of course, Altered Beast. Uh, and out of these uh, seven fine titles, what would you say is your favorite? Personally, I like Thunder Force 2 and uh, Space Harrier 2 the most. Like, I think the crap out of those games. Aw, oh, man, I'm all about that Tommy Lazada base. Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I'm just kidding, man. It's Altered Beast. Uh, I love Altered Beast it's still to this day. I mean, you don't, you don't spend almost $100 trying to get the, uh, the Altered Beast game on PS2 that didn't come out in the States and not like Altered Beast. <laughs> True story. Um, one great thing about the Genesis is, to this day, it's still known as one of not only the most popular Sega systems, but also the one that has had so many revisions, and most of them being officially Sega. Of course, you have the Model 1, which is the initial launch model, the Model 2, which we have up here right now, and it's the model that I think a lot of people grew up with, I know I did. There was the Model 3, which was actually made by Majesco in the late 90s. It was actually kind of them saying, hey, we want to sell Genesis at a budget for people who still aren't getting into 3D gaming, even though that was like the, the, like the mid part of 3D gaming. Um, there were other like really specialty versions, such as the Sega CDX, yes. which was a combination of the Genesis and the Sega CD, which we will talk more about later in the panel. You had the Sega Nomad, 
which was, so everyone talking about the Switch nowadays being a home console that you can take with you, well, the Sega Nomad, even though it sucked up batteries like a, like a vampire, um, um, you know, this was kind of one of the first systems that did it, and to this day is still a highly sought after collectible for, you know, video game collectors everywhere. Um, it also came with a uh, extra battery pack because, it, again, it took up batteries like crazy, and this was before, you know, uh, recharge batteries were such a, you know, widespread thing. There was also the Sega Mega Jet, which was a uh, Mega Drive uh, version that you could only have in uh, Japanese airlines. They would actually hook up to the television sets on Japanese flights, and you could play Sega Genesis games if you wanted to. Um, and if you liked them so much, you could actually buy them uh, from the airport gift shop and take it home with you. Um, After selling a lung in the guy in the alley behind the... Yeah. Um, <laughs> these things are uh, much more expensive now than they were then. You could probably actually buy a good round-trip airplane ticket instead of buying this. Um, a lot cheaper. There was also the Wonder Mega. Um, so Sega had this kind of interesting partnership with JVC back in the day. Uh, JVC is not as big as they used to be. They, like, they still make stuff now, but uh, compared to say like RCA or Sony or Toshiba, like they're, they're not the top dog anymore. But in the 90s they were, especially with CRT televisions. And I guess they had this weird uh, partnership with Sega there for a while. And that's where the Wonder Mega came from. It was, like, it was technically manufactured by JVC, but it was still Sega branded. And it was kind of like the CDX, or the combination, you know, uh, Genesis and uh, Sega CD player. And then, uh, you want to introduce this next one? I'm going to just say, next one's best name ever, period. So the beast that my uh, homeboy is talking about is the Terror Draw. <laughs> <laughs> this is real. This is a home computer that has Genesis guts in it. So, for that time when you're at the office and instead of wanting to, you know, smash your boss's skull in, you, uh, you uh, vent by playing some Golden Axe on your home computer. Um, this thing is probably the most expensive version of the Sega Genesis because, again, it is a home computer. It doesn't just play Genesis, you can actually play PC old DOS games on it and everything. Um, yeah, this thing was a beast and it's, just, it's, it's, it's so interesting that this exists. <laughs> And then we have more modern uh, versions, which are still, they're somewhat Sega branded, but also some of them are not. Uh, the one at the top there is At Games. Now, you guys probably know about this one, because they're the, they're the ones that are always releasing, like, every year. They have, like, 40 um, preloaded Genesis titles in there. Uh, the video playback is good on them. The sound playback is terrible. Like, they have such a hard time emulating the original ship for the Genesis. Now, the one at the bottom here, um, this is actually the Mega SG. It is coming out from Analog, which they are very well known for taking uh, retro systems and making them HD compatible. Um, that actually comes out next week, so you can still get your pre-order if you want one. Um, but yeah, that's coming out, and Analog, they've done great stuff. They also they did a, an HD NES a few years ago, which that one was hella expensive. This one is much cheaper. Comes in uh, four different colors. You know, you got the American brand. Japanese branding, and then of course a white version for that time that you know you looked at your Genesis and thought, huh, it needs to look yellow later. <laughs> <laughs> so you know we're all thinking to ourselves, okay, that's it. Genesis was popular, it was successful. You know we've won. You know, end of story. No. Um, to understand the true success of the Genesis, we kind of have to go behind the scenes and talk about the the, the uh, people and the actions that got it to that high point. So first off, we're going to talk about uh, former CEO of Sega of America, Michael Katz. Um, now, Michael Katz, he was the, uh, the CEO for Sega of America in the late 80s. And it wasn't that he was bad at his job, but he wasn't doing what the shareholders in Japan wanted. Which they wanted, of course, to be Nintendo with the Genesis. Michael Katz, on the other hand, was more um, interested in the Game Gear, which was Sega's handheld console, and it was the first color 8-bit handheld system. He was more excited about that than the Genesis, but Japan was like, no, you're not doing what we want. And this is actually going to be a reoccurring theme with the history of not just the Genesis, but Sega in general. Um, however, Michael Katz's legacy with the company is uh, forever um, you know, held to him because he was the guy who came up with the now infamous slogan, Genesis does what <laughs> Nintendo does. Who can sing it? Anybody can sing it? Sing the, sing the thing? <laughs> Which, that's like a meme now, actually. You know, it's like what John Tron said, uh, you know, Hercules does what Nintendo Hercules so. <laughs> um, so, again, Michael Katz 
Hayao's not a bad guy. He wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing, though. And that's where Hayao Nakayama comes in. Now, Nakayama, he was the head of the shareholders at Sega of Japan, and he was not happy with America's performance in regards to selling the Genesis. So this man traveled all the way to the U.S. <laughs> 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 to find one man, and that man was Tom Kalinske. Now, oh man, how do I summarize Tom Kalinske other than the fact that he's the greatest of all time? Um, so, I, I hate to open up fresh wounds, but um, Tom Kalinske was to Sega of America as Re Reggie fils has been to Nintendo of America these last 15 years. Just an absolute delight of a man trying to help a company that he loves. Um, so why did Nakayama go searching for this guy, you know, Singularity? Well, we got, uh, he was the former CEO of Mattel and Matchbox. Like, so he had already had some major experience with selling a product. Um, he was responsible for the, the resurgence of Barbie in the 80s. Uh, for, the, for those of you who don't know, and I actually had asked my parents about this because my mom used to collect Barbies when she was a kid. Um, Barbie had hit a low point in like the late 70s going into the early 80s because you had stuff like Cabbage Patch Kids coming out and so there was more competition for selling to young girls at the time. Um, this was the man who apparently brought it back from the brink and Barbie's still, you know, flying high to this day, you know, take that as you will. Um, so Nakayama hired this man because this man knew how to sell toys, and at the time, of course, video games were still viewed as toys, stuff, stuff for young people. Um, however, Kalinske had other things in mind. He wanted, to, he wanted to make a brand for Sega that was wholly opposite from Nintendo. Um, Nintendo was very family friendly. They were all about, we are for everyone, but we're mainly for the children. You know, that's what we're trying to sell to. <laughs> Kalinske put a team together you know, made up of people like Al Nielsen, Steve Race, who would go on to be the first uh, marketing uh, director for the PlayStation 1. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's not a good man. Um, and they were all about extreme and edgy marketing. We're going to market to the teenagers, and we're going to market to the adults, and we're going to be a totally different vision from what video gaming is thought of. Now, Another great thing about him is he personally met with store owners and developers. He would actually go in person to, you know, store owners like owners of Target, Kmart, or whoever would sell video games, trying to get the Genesis in their stores. You know, at that time, everyone was like, well, we got the Nintendo. It's, it's the best seller. Why, why else do we need? But um, even with all this, you know, tact and this experience, Kalinsky was still fighting an uphill battle. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Nintendo still had these strict policies about, hey, you're making a game for us, you cannot make that same game for anyone else. This caused a lot of developers to have to deal with the fact that they would either have to develop a wholly new game for the Genesis, or they would have to kind of, you know, tweak the existing game to make it just a little bit different in order to kind of, you know, do that whole loophole thing. You know, where uh, Nintendo got Super C, we got Contra Hardcore. Uh, where they got Super Castlevania 4, we got Castlevania Bloodlines. Where they got Jurassic Park, we got, well, Jurassic Park. <laughs> if you don't know, the uh, Jurassic Park on uh, Nintendo was a top-down shooter where the, uh, it was developed by uh, Ocean Interactive. Jurassic Park on the Genesis was a side-scrolling action platformer developed by Blue Sky Entertainment. Who would on, uh, Members would go on to make like Earthworm Jim and Primal Rage down the road. Um, so, obviously, they needed a little more. From the third, you know, if they couldn't get a lot from the third party circuit, they had to get more from their first party development. And they had good games, they had Revenge of Shinobi, Altered Beast, you know, what have you. They needed an icon, they needed a brand, they needed something that says, hey, we're Sega, this is us, this is what we're about. And they needed something that rivaled Mario. Sega! <laughs> Enter Sonic the Hedgehog. So, like him, like him or not, Sonic is still here to stay, and of course he was the thing that got the Genesis off the ground ultimately here in the States. Sonic was actually developed by uh, designer Yuji Naka and character designer Naoto Oshima. Uh, these guys were pretty much kind of working on, you know, where Yuji Naka was working on kind of a way of, you know, faster parallax scrolling and he wanted to make something with that. 
Nato Oshima was very well known for making animalistic, you know, cartoon characters. Um, and these, you know, two came together to help make the mascot that would help give Sonic and Sega their overall tone. Um, third of all, another person responsible for the Sonic we all know and love is a woman by the name of Madeline Schroeder. She was actually part of Tom Kalinske's advertising team. She would actually uh, email and, you know, kind of talk with the, the Japanese development team about how they wanted Sonic to ultimately look. When Oshima made the first, you know, drafts of Sonic, he was very spiky and he was very rough looking. He had this human girlfriend named Madonna, and she was, yeah. she was, she was very Jessica Rabbit-like. And they were like, well, no, while we are trying to gain that edgy, you know, marketing push towards older gamers, we want him to look soft and appeal to all ages. So, ladies and gentlemen, a woman is responsible for what we know nowadays as the Sonic we know and love, and she does not get enough credit. She is the mother of Sonic. Pay off. Woo! But even with that softness to appeal to everyone, the mandate was down. Sonic was cool, he had attitude, and he was fast. that Sega Genesis had the most 16-bit games, but this new Sonic the Hedgehog, oh, he really ducked my doilies. They say he's incredibly fast. Well, what's the hurry, mister? Hmm? Fan about his attitude. Smarty pants. Why can't it be more like that nice boy Mario? Oh, oh. little brat. <laughs> now get Sonic free when you buy a Sega Genesis system at its new price of $149.99. God, I'm old. I remember. That was on TV. <laughs> <laughs> so where Mario was about precision platforming and saving a princess from an overgrown turtle lizard, um, <laughs> naturally, Sonic was all about going fast, collecting rings, and saving his animal friends from the evil Dr. Iwo Robotnik, later known as Eggman here in the States, was known as Eggman in Japan at the time. He also had to uh, get the Chaos Emeralds. There were six in the first game. They later changed into seven, kind of like the seven Dragon Balls. Um, but he had to, he had to kill like, the uh, emeralds from Robotnik for whatever nefarious scheme or invention that Robotnik had at the time. Um, Sonic would be uh, later joined by his good pal Tails, the two-tailed fox, Miles Prower. And of course, my personal favorite character, I think he's both our favorite character, the uh, no chuckle echidna Knuckles. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> So on the Genesis main system alone, Sonic had four main titles and three spin-offs. Um, this was insane. Like, they were about pushing this character out. Um, further uh, fun facts is that Sonic was also the first video game character to be uh, a, uh, a balloon in the uh, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Furthermore, he also had multiple animated uh, spin-off shows voiced by Steve Urkel, of all people. Go to Leo White. Correct one. Yeah. Did he do that? Yes, he did. <laughs> he also had an ongoing comic book series by Archie Comics that actually lasted a good 20 odd years before it was uh, the partnership ended and was brought over to now IDW Comics. Um, this comic series actually still holds the uh, world record for longest comic book spinoff based off a of video game property. Um, and a lot like a bunch of other icons in the 90s, Sonic also had pasta. It still wasn't enough to get the Genesis to beat uh, Nintendo at 
next sales. Of course, around this time, the, the Super Nintendo was finally coming out. You know, they had Mario World. They were, you know, Nintendo was fighting back at this point. They needed that one last little push to kind of push their sales over the edge. And a game that came, a fighting game that came out in 1992 helped change everything. Yeah. Like, I cannot 
Yeah, no, 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 no. You could only use the power base converter for the Mark I Genesis unless you did a little bit of uh, elbow grease, which I would recommend personally. You would have um, to disassemble this whole thing and put a whole new shell in now, it just to get it. They did release a Mark II power base converter, but only in PAL region. Um, and it costs a pretty penny now. Uh, a lot of indie uh, websites now do make, though, they do make uh, power base converters uh, that will fit all Genesis types, and they're a lot cheaper. So, you know, make that what you want. So that's really it for the power base converter. So I'm gonna let one of my good friends, Chili B, bring in my favorite add-on for the Sega Genesis. Hey! You still don't have a Sega CD? Yeah. What are you waiting for? Nintendo to make one? You have seen the game, right? Wrong answer, man. Show! cartridges and we're going to go to disk base now. Sega CD, like I said, was one of my favorite consoles, or add-ons for the um, Sega Genesis. It was the first CD-based system for Sega, it gave us a 1x CD drive. Woo! Fast. It gave us RCA output on the back, which means now you can hook it up to your stereo and blow your eardrums in a whole different way. <laughs> Full CD quality sound and games, and added two more sound channels to the previous six. So now we can expand our chip music with it. It also adds a little bit more RAM so things could run a little faster. And then introduced us to a little thing called full motion video. They didn't do these a whole lot. They only had a couple of games that actually utilized <laughs> So, amongst the flood of the <laughs> games, there were a couple of gems in, in all of them. We had the infamous Night Trap. Night Trap was uh, save the girls, keep them from getting trapped, and turned into vampires. We had Corpse Killer. Zombie Shooter. It's the most 90s name for a game ever. <laughs> this was made by a company known as Digital Pictures. Every FMV game that I absolutely loved and adored on the Sega CD was made by Digital Pictures. Like, they were like the top dogs. They had two of my personal favorites, a little lesser known ones. There was Double Switch. It was very similar to Night Trap and Save the Residents of the Hotel. Basically, I'm trying to keep all of you from getting trapped by idiot people that are trying to rob you or kill you. And then, Sewer Shark. <laughs> Do I really need to explain Sewer Shark? Rail Shooter. <laughs> then there was the best game. Chance, 
so since nobody here knows what Sonic CD is, we're going to go into <laughs> No, honestly, Sonic CD, I think, was probably one of the absolute coolest games on the Sega CD. Um, had, honestly, two separate soundtracks. The Japanese had one that made more sense, paired with the uh, songs that you heard when you went into the past, because they all matched and they all sounded like one complete thing. But honestly, USA got the better soundtrack, in my Woo! opinion. Very calm, very energetic. Oh my god, yes. I, I remember jamming out in some, in some of the most, the most creepy the most creepy boss music you could ever get, especially for someone like Robotnik. That laugh. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Like, it was, it was great. And fun fact, if you own a copy of this, put it in your CD player, skip track one, rock on. Yeah. 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 Oh, I did that all So, and I love the Sega CD, man, but I'm sorry, we gotta go back to cartridges. Because we're gonna talk about my favorite bad one. <laughs> Look at this monstrosity! I'll buy all the things! The Voltron is complete! Yes. Or Megazord, whichever way you want to go. <laughs> so, the 32X was the uh, next add on uh, for the Genesis. Of course, it was cartridge based. <laughs> Um, 
course, it starred uh, Knuckles the Echidna, who was riding high on the popularity of Sonic 3 and Sonic and Knuckles at the time. The game itself actually started out as a mainline Sonic title. Um, unfortunately, uh, Sega had very different and complicated ideas on how they wanted Sonic to go into the 32-bit era. That's for another panel. Um, <laughs> uh, joined with him are brand new characters, Espio the Chameleon, who is now pretty much the ninja of the uh, Sonic series. Uh, Vector, find the computer room, uh, the crocodile, <laughs> um, who believe it or not actually uh, was developed in Sonic 1. Uh, originally Sonic was going to have like a musical band and there was the band would like play with him on like the sound test menu and Vector was part of that band. That was ultimately cut but then he showed up again later in the spinoff. Uh, Charmy B, which the less we talk about the better. Uh, and then of course Mighty the Armadillo who was yeah. pretty much the substitute for Sonic in the game. Because his, uh, his form factor was very similar to Sonic. Um, and I'm just so happy that he made it his uh, return in Sonic Mania Plus. <laughs> yes. um, but yeah, this is actually a really fun game. It's a very different type of platformer. It's kind of a puzzle platformer where you have you utilize two characters and they use these magic connector rings in order to like propel each other. You kind of have to solve puzzles with them. Um, if you're if you're for the if you're a more traditionalist for the uh, Sonic style, it might not you know excite you as much, but if it's something you want to try something different, and of course you want a really uh, cool uh, technical game for the 32X, well, obviously everyone else bought it. Um, but as I said, the 32X uh, was not a success. Um, part of this was confu uh, consumer confusion and frustration. So Sega at this point in time was starting to oversaturate the market, not just with the Genesis, but add-ons for the Genesis, and there were even, you know, uh, advertisements for things to come. At this point, consumers were like, well, I already bought this game on the Genesis. Why would I want to buy it again or just with something different about it? Or, oh, do I have to buy this thing to play this one game? We've actually kind of all been there before at one point. Um, another problem was there wasn't a lot of developer cooperation. Um, there were developers who would mostly port their games to the 32X, but ultimately they kind of didn't want to develop anything original because they would lose money. The uh, add-on itself wasn't selling, so they weren't going to put in the work to make something either wholly original and lose money off it, or just make another port of a game that they ported to Genesis, to Game Boy, to everything at the time. They, they would just lose more money on it. Um, also, there was the looming promise of the Sega Saturn, um, which of course was to be Sega's first premier 32-bit console. Uh, so a lot of consumers were like, well, if this is coming out in the next few months, why would I want to buy this thing? Uh, because of the failure of the 32X, we also did not get the Sega Neptune, which was actually being prototyped at the, at the time as a Genesis 32X combo system, kind of like the CDX. Um, as someone who owns a 32X, I love my 32X, but I feel like I wish that kind of got released because it would have just been so much more convenient. Um, so we're kind of done talking about add-ons right now. Now we're going to get to some fun stuff. I'm sorry if this may have been, you know, dragged on a little bit, but we're going to talk about some advertising now. Yes. We're going to get more into that, that juicy, the 90s, edgy advertising. Let's that, get nostalgic. Yeah. So first off, we got a couple of print ads. Uh, these are both for the 32X. <laughs> 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 it's a, it's a, it's a, oh! So these are great, because again, you got some more of that weird 32X lewdness. <laughs> and then of course you have, a, you have over here, for Virtual Fighter, it's like this Norman Rockwell painting. It's supposed to look all <laughs> nice and homely. Cool. Domestic violence. <laughs> and the game's not even that violent, to be honest, especially compared to, you know, Mortal Kombat at the time, even Street Fighter. Um, so yeah, just fun stuff. Like, you don't see ads like this anymore. You really don't. And then here's a more tame one uh, for, it's a uh, magazine spread for uh, Sonic and Knuckles talking about the lock-on technology that uh, the game could do. You could plug in uh, Sonic 2 or 3 and play through those games as Knuckles. If you plugged in 3, not only could you play as Knuckles, but you could actually play through the whole game as Sonic 3 was too big of a game that they had to kind of separate it into two uh, separate games. Doing this allowed you to play it all in one go. It's a lot of fun. And you could save 10 bucks by, by mail. Yes. <laughs> yes, those rebates. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, and uh, pretty much if you plug in, what was it, you plug any other game in, you can play Blue Sphere? Yeah, if you plug any game that wasn't Sonic 2 or Sonic 3 in, you could, you'd get the little warning screen, hey, no, this doesn't work, you push A, B, C, and I think hit start, and you play a randomly generated uh, Blue Sphere level 
for uh, that. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I remember uh, going to my cousin's house because he had, he had like every Sonic game before I did, and um, you know he got Sonic and Knuckles, and I was so excited because I can play his Knuckles now. You know, um, and then like I think we tried putting Sonic One in there, and we were like, "What the heck is this?" Like, because we were like, because we we were on, we were misguided on the information of like, "Oh, you can play his Knuckles in any of the Sonic games now, but you couldn't do it in one because there was some weird thing about like the color palette or something like that." There's a thing you can. So now we're going to get into some commercials. Yeah. yeah. So some of these will be a little weird. Uh, these are the best quality we can find them in because of VHS and what have you. My man here re-rendered some of them so we can either hear them or see them better. Uh, the first one up is for the Beavis and Butthead video game. Um, now some of these are actually technically for all ports of these games, but a lot of them have more Genesis, you know, gameplay footage for them. So Beavis and Butthead the game. Finally, some action heroes who know the meaning of action. Take it! And introducing the Beavis and Butthead video game. Feel the thrill of the chase. Discover new and powerful weapons. And control the destinies of America's leading morons. Whoa! For like heroes, this guy like Do it. Do it. Two morons. Three different games. The Beavis and Butthead video game. For Genesis, Game Gear, and Super NES. <laughs> so they're playing a Genesis on the couch. I actually recently only discovered that commercial. I was like, we need that commercial. <laughs> um, so our next commercial, um, so Sega was very much about their fans. Um, and even about uh, how fans can handle bullying in the classroom. Uh, warning, Sega Lim uh, Enterprises Limited is not responsible for any altercations created by this act. <laughs> Um, and then we have... It's real to me. Um, 
And then we have uh, one more that's kind of uh, the ultimate choice at that point in time in the console wars. Gotta go. Hey, you guys, you're the first suit in this game I've seen all morning. Check this out. Brand new 16-bit Super Nintendo with Super Mario World. Wow! Oh, what's this one? Oh, this is a Sonic the Hedgehog from Sega Genesis. Hey, look at these brand new colors, huh? Wow, Sonic's fast, too. No overheating. I like Genesis, and it costs a lot less. We kid, a black game I'll there. take Sonic and Genesis. <laughs> Sonic the Hedgehog, more action, more speed, Sega Genesis, it's a lot more for less. That salesman was, like, selling his heart out. <laughs> he so badly wanted that kid to get a Super Nintendo. Um, so yeah, fun little bits of advertising. Now, the Genesis story doesn't end there, actually. So, up here we have screenshots of modern Genesis games. Yes, there are independent developers. Uh, the great thing about the Genesis is, like, there was no type of, like, these old systems didn't really have, like, a firmware security, you know, lock for, a, you know, anything. Um, they didn't have region locking, but they didn't have, like, firmware security. Uh, so because of that, you know, you have the ability to either reproduce games that maybe they're too expensive and you just want a cheap reproduction that looks good, but they can still play them. Um, a lot of people are now making original, brand new games for the Genesis to this day. Um, you know, the first uh, one up there is Tanglewood that recently came out. Which one of you got the Nim trading card? It's like this little fox character. Okay, that's Tanglewood. It's a recent game that recently came, that came out last year. It was actually developed on original Genesis hardware. And it's, it's available for free. Like, it, it's, it's kind of like a survival uh, platformer game, kind of like uh, the Oddworld games, where like the, the 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 goal isn't just to get to the end; it's also like surviving. Like you know, you can die easily. Uh, there you have Pierce Solar, the Great Architects, which was a RPG um, that uh, it was actually the first of these games to come out. It came out in, like 2000, I think 12, and people were like, "A new Genesis game in 2012? What?" Um, and uh, you have a cool fact about that game, don't you? Cool fact about Pure Solar, if you had the Sega CD, if you got the special edition that came with the CD soundtrack, you could put the CD soundtrack in here, pop the cartridge in here, and the cartridge would actually pump the sound from the Sega CD and play it as the background music. So you got Fun it. fact, you could also put, say, Daft Punk in there if you wanted to and get that in the background too. <laughs> <laughs> or Slipknot. I didn't know that. <laughs> Um, then you have, uh, you have uh, Xeno Crisis, which is kind of a, a new top-down shooter currently being uh, developed. It was uh, kick-started. I actually backed it, and you will actually be able to save a NPC in their name, Ty the Sega Guy. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's kind of like a Smash TV, you know, top-down shooter, very chaotic, but it's kind of like in the vein of, like, you know, aliens or, you know, uh, the thing and all that. Um, then down here, of course, we have the very colorful, probably the biggest beat-em-up to be on the system ever made. It's called Paprium. It's kind of like this cyberpunk, you know, beat-em-up game, kind of like Streets of Rage and Final Fight, if it ever comes out. Um, that game was announced back in, like, 2014, and, like, people did pre-orders for it, and then, like, the, the company that made, that has been working on it, they have radio silence, like, for years. I even pre-ordered it, and I still don't have a copy. Um, it looks amazing, I want to play it, but, you know, we'll see if it ever happens. It looks amazing, though, like, it apparently it's going to have, like, the most memory of, like, any Genesis cartridge ever, or so they say. And then, of course, there's the first-person uh, dungeon crawler, Tomb of Dracula. Um, I don't know how much on that, I actually just recently found out about it while working on this slide. Another, uh, uh tidbit of useless information, uh, the Sega SG has been confirmed that it's going to come with an unreleased Sega Genesis game. That's right, so uh, back in the day there was a game that was going to come out that was called Hardcore. It was a run and gun shooter, kind of in the vein of like Turrican. Um, it was made by DICE, the people who now make Battlefield, but that was back when no one knew who the hell they were. Um, but like, um, that game is actually, they got that game licensed, uh, Analog got that game licensed so that can, they can actually have it preloaded to all Mega SGs. So. That's going to be a fun little thing, so it's kind of like a new new game. Um, so here we have the top 10 best-selling games, and go at it. Sonic the Hedgehog, over 15 million sold. <laughs> Sonic the Hedgehog 2, 6 million sold. Disney's Aladdin, best version, <laughs> 4 million sold. 
Sonic 3, Sonic and Knuckles, 4 million combined. NBA Jam, still to this day the only sports game I like that's not racing. From <laughs> downtown! <laughs> 1.93 million sold. Then of course at number 6 we have Mortal Kombat 2 at uh, 3.78 million. Uh, Street Fighter 2 Special Championship Edition, which was the Genesis version of pretty much just Street Fighter you know, 2 Turbo. Uh, yeah, 1.65 million. Alter Beast at 1.4 million, which makes sense. It was actually originally a pack-in game when the Sega's uh, Genesis originally launched. Uh, another Mortal Kombat with Mortal Kombat 3 at uh, 1.2 million. If you can't tell that I like Mortal Kombat at this point, have you been listening? <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, uh, the uh, Genesis port of Jurassic Park, which uh, is supposedly so roughly sold 1 million. Uh, numbers are not really clear on that one. This was kind of before, you know, numbers for, you know, game sales were um, my personal top five games for the Genesis, of course, Mortal Kombat 1. Uh, Shinobi 3 is definitely number two. Shinobi 3 is actually my favorite first party Sega game of all time. I actually have it downloaded on my 3DS and you can kind of catch me in the halls playing it on the street passes. Um, the uh, Genesis version of Battletoads, uh, some of my friends are in the audience and they know that I uh, love uh, Battletoads to a charmingly, annoyingly degree. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Pulse Man, uh, which if you don't know about Pulse Man, uh, we only got it here in the States back in the day through Sega Channel, which was like the little download service uh, where it took like three, day, three days to download it in one day. Um, I think in Japan and Europe it did get physical release. Um, you can get reproductions for this or if you ever, well, I know the, didn't the Wii, I think the Wii uh, eShop recently closed uh, in regards to like, you know, being supported, but that was re-released re uh, back in the day for like the uh, eShop virtual console. It's a very fun game, it's very colorful, and uh, fun fact, it was actually made by Game Freak before they went on to work with Nintendo to make Pokemon. Um, the famous electric type move Volt Tackle actually originated in Pulse Man. Uh, so there's a little bit of uh, fun uh, Pokemon trivia for you at a second panel. Um, and then of course, I don't think you can really have a top favorite games list for Genesis without any Sonic games, at least for me personally, and of course I gotta go with Sonic and Knuckles. Obviously it's Sonic 3 Part 2, but I give the edge because that it, it was Sonic and Knuckles that gave me the ability to play as Knuckles. Uh, what about you, Ed? What are your favorites? None that are going to surprise anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Streets of Rage 2, I, God, I spent so much time defeating Mr. X in Streets of Rage 2, numerous times. Um, and again, like I said earlier, jamming out to that soundtrack. Tournament Fighters, I put so much time into that game because it was hard. It was not easy when it got to the later levels and you got to Krang or... Karai. Thank you, Karai. Sorry, your name was slipping me. It's been a long weekend. Um, and then there was Sonic 3, Sonic and Knuckles. I put them both up there because I loved both of them equally as much, and I will never forget beating Sonic 3, and when Knuckles jumped on the thing and sacrificed himself so Sonic could save the world and all that, I, you know, ran bawling to my grandmother like, oh my god, you know, Knuckles, he, he sacrificed himself and saved me. And it was, and it was a thing, like, that was the first time I got emotional over a game. And then, there was Toe Jam and Earl's Panic on Funkatron. I couldn't tell you how much time I spent on that trying to find everything. <laughs> Bouncing on pink flubber and throwing jars at everything that moved. Hyper Funk Zone. Oh, okay, the Hyper Funk Zone. You want to know what drugs feel like? Just spend some time in the Hyper Funk Zone. Um, the game was a trip. It was funky. It was fun. I, I remember making my own beats every time I walk up to somebody with a boombox, pop in the corner, be like, just, yeah, you do your thing, I'm going to do my own beat over here, I'm going to be the next uh, Jam, Master uh, Jam Master J or something. <laughs> it, it, it was fun. So, we're almost uh, pretty much done with this panel. Uh, before we kind of officially end this, we do have a little bit of time. Audience members, are there any games that you enjoyed that maybe people you don't know about, or like, what memories do you have with the Sega Gen? Yes, Brian. Uh, I've got one that you didn't mention, but I'm sure you guys probably know about it. Gunstar Heroes. I, I know. What? See, 
another game we're I know you love that I know you love that I love Trevor. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else like to share? Yes. Shining Force was fantastic. Shining Force was fantastic. Shining Force 2 was actually the first game that my mom and I played together. So oh, that's very close. Cool. Uh, on the same scene, those games always were just. Yeah. Luminar was amazing. Yes, he was my first one. Yeah. Yeah. You went to hack. I just want a little story on this. I remember vividly my parents took me as a little kid to a way, way out there outlet mall to buy the, buy the, buy the CDX. Oh, yeah. I actually had a CDX. Yes, it did. It came with, it came with Sonic CD, it came with Echo the Dolphin, and it came with that like, six, six game disc of arcade thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I treasured that thing. I, I had no idea how rare it was until one day I'm like, this is actually worth something? <laughs> I remember I wanted that thing sub hardcore. Like, that was the portable CD player I wanted. Yeah, like, I wanted that thing in fear. Yeah. Else you like to, uh, uh, yes, I saw you first. Well, this is a weird one, but I want to start right here. I don't remember that. Not the movie one. The movie one is very good in its own right. Yeah. Very good movie one, but the fighting one, mm -hmm. which was very broken and only has two buttons. Yeah. Light attack, heart attack, has a great soundtrack. Oh, yeah, it does. It's a great manifesto. And I just found out, like, a couple weeks ago, maybe last week, that there's actually a kid finishing. Thank you.